rather than saying, no, this is how you do it. It's, no, I'm going to provide you with a situation. You go and figure it out. You go and explore, create. So when uh, should players start developing their turning skills then? Thinking age-wise. Straight away. <laughs> I think it's, we've talked a lot about on the ball, off the ball. Um, so from the, the youngest ages, even just getting them used to moving, changing direction without, without a ball, getting them used to slowing down, changing direction and then accelerating in different directions, that's going to help them. So you're already starting to work on it. Um, individual work on, on the ball because we know that obviously the more touches they get, they're going to be more confident. So I, I'd like to spend a lot of time with them being able to protect the ball because if they feel confident in protecting, they'll be, feel confident as they're receiving or they're on it, they can twist and turn and use their body to then get away. You're just trying to build that confidence from a young age where they, they, they know they can look after that ball. I think that's going to aid their turning. Um, and then build it into to paired work where they, they're, they're now receiving and they're traveling, um, ideally in direction, so that you know they, they're, they've got a purpose to get to and they know that they're turning for a reason. Um, but yeah, I think you continue to work, work on it as you, as you move up through the age groups as well. There's sort of three letters that's like ABC, so a bit, uh, agility, balance and coordination, which are crucial to be able to turn. So if we can help the players from young ages with those three things, we're then going to provide them with the foundations and the base to be able to execute the turns that James has mentioned at quicker speeds at the right times and making sure that the timing's right for those turns. But things without the ball, so tag games and, you know, games that children play at school, like that, what they're doing, like what's the time, Mr. Wolf, and just being able to stop and turn and change directions. Um, Cops and Robbers is another, another example that I remember playing when I was in the school and you're having to change direction loads and accelerate and de-accelerate and that's without a ball and if we can then transfer that into football we can support the players as, as, as they start from a really young age. And as they get older then we can start maybe dropping in more, we, we, uh, the more challenges around for example can you try um, a, a, a no touch, or can, or can your first touch take you towards the goal you're scoring? Um, they have a bit more understanding of what you mean by that. So then, you know, you're challenging them within games in particular to, okay, where do I go? How do I position my body? Um, can I scan for the defenders? Am I capable of doing that right now? Um, so yeah, it's it's getting the basics, and then you can start to encourage them in in different different game situations as to what type of turns you might want to use. How can you help them with mastering the body and the ball? I think it goes back to games Games in terms of what James said around we even without a ball. So if we think about mastering the ball initially, we may have to master the body. So can we think about those playground games that players are playing, handball practices, um, even professional teams. You look at some of the videos that they do on their international camps. They're playing handball. They've got tennis balls. They're doing something different away from a football. They're mastering their body by performing things like agility, their balance, their coordination, using different parts of their body, the timing of they do something. Then incorporating a ball into what they've done so they get a little bit of memory within their body with, with the ball. So we, we've talked a bit about a smaller number of practices. Um, uh, Nimesh mentioned 3v3s, 2v2s. So just anything that's gonna give them lots and lots of repetition of being able to turn. Um, and when you start to go into the larger formats where you see it training maybe 7v7s, 9v9, you kind of think to yourself, well, there's gonna be a lot of players that are watching the game because there's only one ball and there's you know, 14 players all vying for it. So in our training sessions, the smaller numbers, lots of repetition, and then just providing the key sources of information. So there are other players either interfering or directly challenging you because that starts to guide what you do. If you don't, if you don't have that, then you might be uh, doing turns that uh, would lead you to being tackled, for example. So it's just trying to provide them with information that they can use that they can then apply in the games. I think, I think for coaches that might be working in the 11v11 game or like bigger formats like James mentioned, they might be thinking, well, why would I want to do 3v3 practices or what benefit is there of a 2v2 practice? Putting players in smaller formats gives you more repetition, more chance for them to improve and hone in on their techniques for something specific like a turn. 
to then go into a bigger size format where they can then try and execute it, which is which is more game based. So it's perfect to try and sometimes go into smaller areas to help you notice and think where might my players need support. It then also gives them more repetition and more number of touches. Ultimately, we want to help them become more skillful. Uh, how can you uh, coach turning effectively in your sessions to avoid it going stale from maybe just being the coach that's doing kind of a show and tell approach and telling players how uh, all about the range of techniques that they can use? It's kind of like what we've already described, creating those situations um, where you know they've got to get the ball from A to B or goals in your sessions. Um, adding the challenge of, of defenders again, you have to be careful about the the level that you're working with and whether they're ready for for that. But it's adding appropriate challenge, adding a direction, adding a target, adding a goal for them to get to, so that there's a purpose for it, and then adding in those key key bits of information. And but also just in particular, I mean, you might argue this for the old ones, but very much so for the younger ones, letting them experiment and and just rather than saying no, this is how you do it. It's, no, I'm going to provide you with a situation. You go and figure it out. You go and explore, create, and kids will come up with some wonderful solutions to get themselves out of it. And they will, it might not always involve turning, but a lot of the times it will. And it's then just kind of praising it, celebrating it, and thinking, yeah, that was, that's, that's good, that's clever, I like that. So that's, that's, I think that's how we can encourage it within our Yeah, our I think I've, I've taken some real key, key bits there from what James has said around having a directional practice. So we want to go from one place to another. So I want to think about if I want to work on turning, I want to put my players in an area where they've got to go from one place to another because that's what's going to happen on a game day. And the second thing is around just letting them explore and have a go. So we look at, and if, if I ask any coach to think about the most skillful thing or the best turn they've ever seen, it might be something a professional's done off the cuff within a milliliter of a second. And they've not done that just standalone, unopposed in, in a session. They've done that because they've tried to put a few things together. Players will try different turns. So we might say and phrase the question to the players, find a way or could you try to or show different types of turns to go from one place to another in a practice. Otherwise, we may just get players and we say, right, you're only going to do an inside turn and you're only allowed to do an outside turn. And we're then inhibiting and prohibiting them from trying to do different things. And we want them to be skillful. We want to provide them with an inspirational opportunity in a directional practice against opposition. So let's put that on in training sessions. Let's give them the opportunity and the exposure and the license of freedom to try different things to go from one place to another. Is it important that players feel comfortable um, turning in tight, crowded spaces and how can coaches help them to, to get to that point? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I think if, if, uh, if I think about someone like Lionel Messi, as an example, if someone would have told him every time you do a turn and you lost the ball, it's wrong, you can't do that again. We would never see a player like, like how he is. So we have to give players these opportunities and let them try. Trial and error is a great way in, in training practices to give players opportunities in areas 2v2, 3v3s to have a go because they can then do those in games. If we, if we censor them and tell them that something's wrong every time they try and it fails, we're never going to be able to support players that are going to try and, and have, a, have a career hopefully in the game. So I'd say make sure that we're providing opportunities for players to have a go but understand that we set the environment as a coach holistically to say failing is okay and mistakes are going to happen in practices, allow the mistakes to happen so they feel comfortable to, to continue to keep playing. I think if you look at the speed of the game at the elite level, it's so fast in terms of now with defending teams pressing you very, very quickly, you're always going to find yourself in a tight space more often than not. So we've just got to try and recreate the, those situate, those tight spaces in our practices. So it just it can be as simple as just reducing the spaces that players have to play in where they can be closed down quicker and it's how do you then deal with that. Um, again, just check the level of the players. And like I said, if, if, it's, if it's players who are new to the game, it might be that there is no threat, but you're in a tight space. How do you move maneuver yourself through those tight spaces? And if you come against somebody, can you turn away from them? Um, but yeah, it, it's very, very important to be able to, to deal with those kind of spaces. Yeah, so what are your key coaching points uh, that you think coaches should reiterate to players uh, when they're working on turning the mesh, if you want to go first? I think for me, it's about 
giving them the license to explore and not being really pigeonholing a specific type of turn and only wanting to work on one type of turn. If the players are brand new, it may be a great opportunity for them to understand them in, in unopposed scenarios, but we wanted them to try and express themselves and we want to hopefully create players that are going to go and play professionally right at the top end of the game. And we can only do that by giving them the license to try as many different types of turns and manipulate their body as best as they can. Um, the second thing, or my, my final tip would be, try to use games that are directional against someone, opposed against number of people, whether that's more or less, where we're going from one place to another, which helps us with the realism of the game. And sometimes just taking away the football and thinking back to the games we played as, as kids and going back and thinking, right, what type of turn did you use when you played cops and robbers and how did you get away from that person to get to that area? Can you now try it with the football? So those are some things that I would try. And the only thing I'd add on there is that, well, which I mentioned around repetition. So go back, think about your practice design. There's no, there's no point in having a line of players where you have to wait a minute before you actually get to do maybe one turn and then have to wait another minute before you get to do a one turn. It's um, Turning is very much individual, so how, how, how can we provide players with lots and lots of opportunities to do it? So that's where your smaller numbers comes in, working in either by yourself in a ball um, or in pairs or in threes, just so that you get lots of opportunities to do it. That's going to make them better turners on the ball or off the ball. So yeah, I think that'd be my top tip.